My name is Norman Murray. I'm a past director of the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, which is an institute here at the University of Toronto, just across the street there, uh, in the Clinton Tower. Um, <coughs> seated as a unit in the Faculty of Arts and Science. Uh, it was founded more than 30 years ago, in 1986. So, uh, one of the two founders, Peter Martin and Dick Henderson, uh, is Peter is up here in the front row, or next to the front row. Um, he is still a professor at the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. Um, and uh, he's been involved in a number of other uh, well-known institutions here in Toronto, including the Dunlap Institute. He's also the uh, chair of, Astro of uh, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics for Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you get a chance, uh, it's easy to recognize up there, but say hello to me. Um, <laughs> uh, CETA is supported by the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC. Uh, in other words, your tax dollars, so thank you for that. Um, it's also supported by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. has been throughout its uh, history. Uh, one of the founding members of CETA is also sitting in the front, Dick Vaughan, uh, was the chair, is that what they call it? Director of the Gravity and Cosmology Program for uh, 25 years? Seems like that. Seems like that. <laughs> so, so, a long time, let's put it that way. Uh, so they've been supporting CETA for, uh, for the, as I say, since the founding as well. <coughs> so our mission is to carry out research in theoretical astrophysics uh, and to support research across Canada. Uh, one of the primary ways we do that is through the support of postdoctoral fellows, and there are a number of them in the audience here today. Uh, there's typically about 20 postdoctoral fellows in CETA at any time, and another three or four currently at institutions across Canada. Again, this is all funded by uh, NSER. Uh, you can learn a lot more about CETA at the website. Uh, so www.cita.utoronto.ca. Uh, uh, so this is the Raymond and Beverly Sackler uh, lectures. Uh, they were funded by uh, the Sacklers in 1996. Um, and it was made to support the visit of internationally uh, Distinguished theorists who could give two talks on uh, astrophysics. Uh, a technical talk, which uh, our speaker tonight gave uh, yesterday at CETA. And of course, the public talk, which you're here for. Uh, and also to promote interactions between the people at CETA and lecturers, I mean, uh, researchers from around the world. Uh, so we consider the Sackville lectures to be the highlight of the academic year at CETA, and they play a prominent role in the Institute's academic life. Uh, you can go on the website and look at a list of the past Sackler lectures, but I'll just read through a couple of them real quick. The first inaugural lecture was given by then Sir, now Lord Martin Rees, uh, the Astronomer Royale, or past Astronomer Royale, Peter Goldreich, <coughs> Jim Peebles, a famous Canadian uh, astrophysicist, uh, Frank Shu, John Bacall, I and mean, this is if you're in astrophysics, these names really mean a lot to you. Andre Linde, one of the people who's been uh, one of the founders of inflationary theory. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, I won't uh, go through the, all of it, but uh, in the last few years we've had Don Lyndon Bell uh, back in uh, 2011, Joe Silk, Ellen Zweibel, uh, Alex Soleil, and uh, tonight Vicki Caligara. Um, so Vicki Caligara is the Daniel I. Linzer, Distinguished University Professor and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University, just north of Chicago. She's the Director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics, or Sierra, at Northwestern. And she's a Senior Fellow of the Gravity and Extreme Universe Program, which is the successor to the program that Professor Bottom is heading, of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. In other words, she does have uh, close connections with the Canadian Astrophysics. Uh, as you'll see, she works on the astrophysics of compact objects, which means white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. Uh, and uh, she's been working uh, on these objects since she was a graduate student at the University of Illinois with Ronald Budman. And then she was a postdoctoral fellow at CFA. I'm going to get the whole list right here. Uh, and, and then moved on to becoming a professor at Northwestern at Sierra when she was one of the co founders uh, she's made a number of outstanding contributions to theoretical astrophysics, but I don't want to waste all your time. She was supposed to be talking, listening to her, not me. But I did want to put up one uh, slide, so I add, added it to Vicky's. 
uh, she was interested, this is in the late 1990s, in uh, the mergers of some of these compact objects. And she was aware that there was a new instrument that was, had been funded by the National Science Foundation of the US. It hadn't started construction yet at the time. It was around that time it started building. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she wrote a paper, which I had her at the slide. There it is. Okay. And it says, an upper limit on the coalescence rate of double neutron star binaries in the galaxy. Uh, and at the time, as I said, she was with the Harvard CFA. And uh, hopefully you can read the, uh, it says receive 1999, August 2nd, except for 1999, October 10th. Didn't have much trouble with the referee, I guess. Uh, but it says down here, the bottom line there, such a galactic rate, this is the two neutron stars merging. Such a galactic rate implies a possible detection by the enhanced, or now it's called advanced, I guess, LIGO of up to 10, to a few to 10 mergers per year, okay? And uh, as she'll tell you, they have detected a neutron star merger, and after a lot of work, they also predicted the rate. It's more or less bracketed exactly by this, one to 10 per year, okay? So uh, that is science at its best, right? 20 years, 17 years before the event, predict the rate, which actually comes out to be more or less correct. Um, she's received a number of awards. Again, I don't want to waste too much of your time, but I really <coughs> highlight the Hans Bethe Prize of the American Physical Society, because Hans Bethe was a great physicist who worked on a broad range of things, but including neutron stars, compact objects that resulted in uh, supernova. Uh, <coughs> and as part of LIGO, and for a number of other reasons, she's received a long surprise. So I, I picked out a couple of the Einstein Medal from the Einstein Society in Switzerland. That's not a bad medal to get. Uh, the Bruno Rossi Prize, uh, the ILP Physics World Breakthrough of the Year, again for the neutron, not the neutron star merger, the binary black hole merger. The Gruber Prize, uh, the Breakthrough Prize, which is a different one than the ILP Physics Prize. And there's a, a long list. Of, uh, you can look up for CV if you're interested. So as I said, uh, uh, let's get right to it. That's the Calagera. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me well? It's a pleasure to be here. I have spent two wonderful days. I had a lot of meetings back to back. Uh, I gave another talk yesterday, and it's a pleasure to be giving this public lecture tonight. Um, thank you, Norm, for revealing my age uh, <laughs> <laughs> and reminding me a paper I didn't remember I wrote. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it does come back working with Duncan, uh, a colleague of mine. Uh, so it's a pleasure today to tell you, uh, and I'll have to find my rhythm here, and I remember that I do have a slide changer. Let's see. Yes? Okay. Uh, so it's a pleasure today to tell you about uh, two thrilling years uh, that members of the LIGO and Virgo collaboration have lived. Uh, I want to, I'm going to do proper introductions through the slides in a minute, but I want to say that here at CETA, uh, there's young members, younger than me, <laughs> members of the collaboration. So I'm looking at two of them up there, and I know there's more, and I can't find them all right now. but. Uh, Many of the prizes uh, you've heard about today uh, were not awarded to me personally, but to the whole collaboration for discoveries that we made in the last two years. So they have gotten those prizes as well. <clears throat> so today I'll tell you a little bit about what we have discovered in gravitational waves. Uh, and our first discovery actually happened in uh, the first signal we saw uh, came on September 14, 2015 that will be the date that we say marked in our brains uh, for life. Uh, and the latest big discovery uh, that we made a big fuss about is actually the discovery, uh, the first one involves black holes, the second one involves objects that are called neutron stars, so I'll tell you some about that towards the end of my lecture, uh, that are actually uh, more less compact than black holes, so I'll tell you a little bit about those as well. And these, you can see them here, uh, to scale about the Chicago skyline, uh, which is probably similar size, I, I'm guessing, uh, to the uh, Toronto skyline. Okay, so let's get started. <coughs> Oops. Uh, so I guess I pushed the wrong. Okay, now that's the direction. Let me see if I. That's it. 
Okay. So, as I told you, I'm uh, gonna start with our first detection and then move to the, not the latest detection, but uh, the latest big announcement we had with the binding So, I'm gonna start with our very first from September 2015, and that was the pair of two black holes. I'm gonna tell you what black holes are. And they were detected by these two detectors. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about these two weird telescopes, new kinds of telescopes that they don't detect electromagnetic waves, but detect gravitational waves. So I'll tell you what gravitational waves are. And what we saw that day in September uh, was signals that look like this, little scribbles in our detectors. And in a different representation, they look like little bananas. So I'm going to tell you what those are. Now, let me see if I can get this. There. So, the signal arrived on September 14, 2015, but it took us many months first for us to get convinced that those signals were actually real and there were no noise in our detectors. And then it took us many months to, pre to develop all our results. And actually, we made the announcement at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Um, on February 11, 2016. And that was that day. Uh, the announcement was first made by our uh, lab director, Dave Reitzing, who is a Northwestern alum. Our then spokesperson, uh, Gabriela Gonzalez, uh, Ray Weiss, and Kip Thorne, who are the fathers of this whole enterprise of detecting gravitational waves uh, and making predictions for what signals we'll see. And I was sitting somewhere. <laughs> um, all right, and this is what they said. People who get the sound. Jenny, do you know how I get the sound from the perspective? <laughs> I have the cable in. Um, so this was the amazing event, and this 
were waves we had never, ever been able to detect, but it was a dream for almost a century. So what we saw that day was this merger of two binary black holes. The signal, it was not the movie, but the signal was these little scribbles in two detectors, one in Livingston, Louisiana, and one in Hanford, Washington. And if you uh, align them properly, given the distance in the, in the country, in, in the US, then you could see that the signals were perfectly uh, aligned with one another. And this uh, detection, the sign, the signal, was exactly as predicted by Einstein based on his theory of general relativity. He could tell that if you had black holes moving in this way, they should be producing a signal like this. This collision was, uh, had happened, we could tell from our signal, that had happened over a billion years ago. Uh, it was 50 times brighter than all the stars in the universe, except this brightness didn't come in light, it came in gravitational waves. Uh, it was 3 million times the energy that is needed to destroy the sun, and that energy was produced in 0.2 seconds, all through that final collision. And the final black hole was only about 300 kilometers across. You see, I speak kilometers. Because <laughs> I'm from Europe. Um, and uh, the two objects were moving, were the fastest ever moving objects we had observed. They were moving at half a billion kilometers per hour, uh, about 6.6 uh, of uh, the speed of light, the two black holes right before they collapsed. Okay, so this one source broke a lot of records. Based, even though astronomy breaks records all the time in terms of the most powerful, most distant, or most luminous, or whatever you want to call it. Um, now, as I said earlier, this was the achievement of many, many people. Uh, so lots of institutions across the world, actually. Uh, so here is CETA. Uh, here's my current institution, Northwestern. But there's Australia, there's lots of other uh, institutions across the world, including UK, Germany, somewhere, etc., Asia. And this is a coordinated effort of people, scientists, and engineers across the world. We have telephones throughout the day and the night and the week. I keep looking at my driver colleagues. And we somehow uh, ended up getting that signal and pinching ourselves, not realizing that what we were working for decades actually became reality. All right, so uh, when the detection was announced in February, within days, it actually became a conversation piece and it entered everyday life and pop culture. So let me show you only a couple of things. So apparently, I think two <laughs> days later, in the, in the um, subway in, in New York City, you could find this sign. Um, a fashion designer uh, designed a uh, dress that has a gravitational wave signal all around it. Um, and you can order it on the internet. There are now ties with it, so men can enjoy the fashion. Um, and then the new, oh, oh, there were donuts in the <laughs> And the New Yorker has this cartoon of two little birds chirping around. I'll come back to why chirping, but this signal of the gravitational waves has a characteristic of a chirp sound, if it were sound wave. And so the, um, oops. So the question was, was that you I just heard, or was it two black holes collided? <laughs> Within about a week. Okay. Uh, we got, um, uh, back then we also, the US had a president who was tweeting, uh, not that frequently, and uh, Obama, uh, on the day of the announcement, tweeted and congratulated the LIGO collaboration for the discovery. Okay, so why is this discovery such a big deal? Okay, so I'll try to answer this question. So uh, I'm going to go back to uh, astronomy's beginnings and ask you, what do you think was the very first telescope for astronomy? Galileo. I hear Ga Galileo. Yes. Before Galileo? Thomas Harriot of London. Good. Knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> Before that? 
I'm not looking for a name. The human eye. Human eye. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so our eyes were the first telescopes, okay? So the first way we observed the universe was with light, visible light that our human eyes are uh, 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 sensitive to. But until 1609, when Galileo, uh, with some help from the other names that you mentioned, put together two lenses. Uh, it wasn't Galileo who put together the two lenses, but let's follow the, the, the story. He did get his hands into something like this. And he looked up the sky and started what we call modern astronomy and discovered, among other things, uh, uh, satellites around Jupiter. <coughs> okay. Then, uh, essentially, of, uh, uh, then we had three, three centuries of optical astronomy with regular telescopes <coughs> where we could make lots of observations in the visible. Okay. Uh, and then we had um, uh, lots of uh, telescope innovation and cosmic exploration using all kinds of telescopes uh, that expanded, started with optical telescopes uh, like these at the tops of the mountains, uh, best locations for big telescopes. Uh, and then we moved to radio and space telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope and X-rays and infrared and uh, I made this slide a long time ago. <laughs> Astronomers, which satellite is this? Fermi. Is it Fermi? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Fermi will play uh, a role uh, later in our story. Okay, so all of astronomy is based basically up until 2015, with a couple of exceptions with neutrinos, on electromagnetic waves, which is periodic oscillations of electric and magnetic fields, okay? Uh, so they have a particular characteristic, the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to one another, but we're not gonna go to the details of all of this. And electromagnetic waves are not just the visible light that our eyes can detect, but they come in this full spectrum from the most energetic electromagnetic waves um, down here, uh, highest frequency, gamma rays, all the way to the uh, lowest frequencies, longest wavelengths, a radio, and everything in between. And over the years, we managed, basically in about one century, we managed to develop astronomy throughout all of these wavelengths. So we started uh, with the visible, with Galileo, and then from about 1932 to about 1970s, but mostly in the 60s, the 60s was an amazing decade for, for many reasons, uh, we opened lots of windows in astronomy. All right, so there they are, radio, gamma rays, x-rays, microwaves, and infrared. So this was the world of astronomy, of modern astronomy, uh, up until a few uh, years ago. So on September 14, a new astronomy era was started because now we had the ability of observing the universe with a new kind of telescope. It doesn't look like a telescope. It doesn't have a lens, but it can detect gravitational waves. And we detected them for the first time. Not only we detected gravitational waves, but for the first time, we discovered a new type of astronomical source, a pair of black holes. Black holes don't emit electromagnetic waves. So there was no way of knowing that the universe can form a pair of black holes. There was theoretical predictions. Many of us had made theoretical predictions that binary black holes should exist in the universe. But the only way for us to confirm those predictions was to have the ability to build telescopes that can detect gravitational waves for the first time. So this is where we were a couple of years ago. So now let me try and explain to you a little bit what are gravitational waves, okay? So electromagnetic waves, oscillations of electric and magnetic fields uh, produced by charged particles. Gravitational waves are not connected to charged particles, they're connected to massive objects. <clears throat> so it goes back to Einstein uh, who basically developed uh, in uh, 1915 published his theory of general relativity, which was a new way both 
physically, intuitively, and mathematically. It was a new way of thinking about what gravity is. And as a, uh, so let's first try, and let me give you a two slide or something, to a tutorial on general relativity. <laughs> don't get scared if you don't use the book. Um, so, so his idea was rather radical because it, it, didn't, it didn't have any you know, intuitive connection to how people were thinking about gravity at that time. Um, so what he proposed is that actually gravity is all about mass deforming space-time, warping the geometry of space. We're going to only talk about space to make things simpler. And it changes reference distances between points that otherwise are disturbed, undisturbed. So if you put masses in an undisturbed flat space, then the masses are going to cause warps. Okay? And if I now have one of the mass at least moving around the other mass, the warping is actually causing ripples on this space, waves, and the warping now becomes a periodic motion on this space that now propagates away from the source. Okay? It's like having a flat lake which is undisturbed, no mass is present, and then you throw a stone on the lake, <coughs> you disturb the flat surface of the lake, and you cause ripples, and from where you threw the stone, the ripples propagate away. So it's that kind of picture. Uh, so waves propagate, the gravitational waves are basically oscillatory disturbances of space, space-time, and they propagate away from the source that generated them at the speed of light. That's what he, Einstein's math showed. Um, and the waves are carrying energy, the wave electromagnetic waves also carry energy. <coughs> so the way to think about them is uh, simply space ripples. It's really the way to think about it. All right, that's with your tutorial in general relativity and gravitational waves. <laughs> now, did we know gravitational waves existed? So, 1916, uh, Einstein makes the prediction. Um, it comes out of the math. Even himself and other scientists don't believe the waves are real. Okay? And really took it went up and down within the physics community or whether the waves are real or some mathematical contraction that yes falls out of the, of, the, of the theory, but it never gets generated in nature. And around the 50s, people get convinced that waves might actually exist in nature. The question is, how do you convince the community to build detectors that might detect gravitational waves you don't know for sure that these waves exist, okay? Um, so electromagnetic waves, we knew they existed, at least we had our eyes, and, and we knew they exist. Uh, so it turns out we knew gravitational waves exist, okay? And what happened in the 70s is that Joe Taylor and his graduate student at the house were observing radio waves from a special kind of object. So radio waves are electromagnetic waves. And they were observing two neutron stars that one of them was emitting pulses in radio waves. I won't explain why, okay? So imagine now a radio beacon instead of a light uh, beacon, visual wave, and that you can see with radio telescopes. They figured out for the first time, it was the first time that while making this observation of these radio pulses from one of these objects, they figured out by the frequency of the arrival of the pulses that this one object had a companion that was not emitting anything. And they figured out that this was a binary system with two compact objects, neutron stars, which are compact objects that are forming at the end of uh, the lives of massive stars when they run out of fuel. So you have two compact objects in an orbit, and they started studying this binary and watching the radio pulses. And 
measuring exactly to exquisite accuracy when the pulses are up. And they figured out not only that now you have a pulsar, radio pulsar, and a companion next to it, and they're going one around the other, they can figure out how far apart they were. But from studying the radio pulsars over years, they found that the two neutron stars were not in a stable orbit going one around the other, but actually they were coming ever so slightly closer and closer and closer together. And, ah, I don't have that clock, so I'll keep, I'll keep explaining it in words. So they, they were able to measure how fast the two neutron stars were coming closer and closer together. And the change in the distance was very small but measurable with radio waves. And the rate of shrinking of the orbit was exactly the rate you would have expected if those two <coughs> neutron stars were actually emitting, were disturbing the space around them. They were emitting gravitational waves exactly as Einstein predicted. The waves were carrying energy away from the orbital motion. And because the orbital motion was losing energy, the neutron stars were coming slightly closer and closer together. And that was measurable with error bars. And everything was exactly as Einstein had within the error bars. To point, I think in 10 years, they could tell it was to 0.1% accuracy. And that there was nothing else that could be consistent with that kind of energy loss that could explain that observation. So we didn't have observations of gravitational waves. We had observations of radio waves, okay, radio waves. But the shrinkage of the orbit, consistent with exactly what Einstein had predicted, was telling us gravitational waves exist. And that was 74. And that was around the time that Ray Weiss at the press conference in 2016 in February started thinking, I'm going to figure out a way to build a detector to detect gravitational waves. Now, I'll tell a little story, and I, I'm not keeping track of my time, but I can't resist telling this story, which Ray himself says. The way Ray decided he's going to figure out how to build a detector to detect the gravitational waves was not because he was driven by this basic question immediately because he heard about the radio pulsar. But in fact, he was an assistant professor at MIT. And he was working on a completely different type of experiment. And his department chair walked into uh, his office in the summer and said, um, Ray, uh, I need you to teach general relativity. Uh, next fall, okay? And Ray says, yes, of course, okay, no problem. And the department chair leaves the office, closes the door, and Ray goes, people who know Ray know that Ray swears, I can't swear right now, <laughs> Ray swears and says, I don't know gravitational general relativity. I, uh, of course now I have to teach general relativity to MIT undergraduates, but I've never taken general relativity. <laughs> So he spends the whole summer learning general relativity on his own, uh, figuring out everything about Einstein's theory, learning about gravitational waves, and then he became curious as an experimentalist if these waves exist, of oh, these theories, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> if these waves exist, I'm going to detect them. And that's how his story started. <laughs> okay, now, how do we detect gravitational waves? So the way you detect anything <coughs> is first you have to figure out what is the effect on something, okay? So the, the, the question boils down to if I want to detect gravitational waves on Earth, you have to figure out what do gravitational waves do on Earth, <coughs> something on Earth. So the question that translates is how do I detect the gravitational waves? The question becomes what is their effect? So the effect is that if I had a gravitational wave propagating from a binary black hole at the end of the room and coming 
perpendicularly on the screen. And I had two perfect circles on the screen with points that were undisturbed. When the wave crosses the screen, the points get start to oscillate in this manner. Okay, very characteristic X and cross, and they oscillate back and forth, and they get stretched and squeezed in the way you see in the little movie. Now, this is hugely exaggerated. Because if indeed the wave caused that much of a stretch and a squeezing, we would all be going like all the time like this. Because I can tell you, gravitational waves are going through here as we speak. <coughs> okay. The effect is not that big. And that's where the challenge lies. OK, so the waves are extremely weak. Um, and, and a typical wave from a, a pair of binary black holes at the center of our galaxy, for example, which is really close by, uh, would cause the Earth, the whole Earth, to change its radius by as much as the size of a shot. <coughs> okay? So this is not visible by that. <laughs> so Ray, um, along with you know, based on some literature and some ideas that existed uh, from scientists in Germany, Russia, and, Black and, and Scotland, um, designed basically that summer, designed the basic idea of what I'm about to show you in a little movie, designed <coughs> the core idea for a laser interferometer working as a gravitational wave detector. Once he designed it in his little scribbles and notes, he gave it as homework in his class <laughs> the next time, to the MIT. <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right, so let's see. So a laser interferometer, I'm going to let the movie play. And then I'll try to, again, highly exaggerate. So the idea is you have a laser at some corner. You let it propagate. I can use the pointer. Let it propagate. It goes through something we call a beam splitter. The beam gets split into two things, and the beam propagates down two arms, bounces off two mirrors at the end of the arms. The two beams come back, they combine, and they come here in a detector. And then we look at the two beams. And if a wave had crossed our L-shaped detector, then you saw the arms would have squeezed and stretched, squeezed and stretched in a periodic way. Not that much. <laughs> okay? By an exquisitely small amount. Uh, but there was going to be a change in the distance of this arm length and the distance of this arm length. And that change was not going to be random. It was going to be squeezing on one side and stretching on the other back and forth. So, uh, so that's the core idea, and this is what our telescopes look like. This is how gravitational waves look like. Um, so L-shape in Washington and L-shape in Louisiana. Uh, and uh, the question is now, let me actually tell you how small is the stretching and squeezing that really these detectors are measuring. Um, so it is actually only 10 to the minus 18 meters. <coughs> so what does this mean? I'll try to give you a sense of how small this is. I gave you already a sense that if you took the whole Earth and you, you put a binary black hole at the center of a galaxy, the stretching and squeezing is only the size of the drop. But again, let me try another way to give you some sense. This 10 to the minus 18 change in length is the following. You take one meter, very roughly, like this, and you divide it by 10,000, and you get the thickness <coughs> of the human hair. You divide it by 100, the human hair, you get roughly the wavelength, not that big, you get roughly the wavelength of light. You divide it by another now factor of 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom, 
you divide the atom by 100,000, you get the diameter of a nucleus. You divide the nucleus by another 1,000, and that's 10 to minus 8. OK, so now you can imagine why Einstein, when he first did the calculation, he wrote, OK, nice gravitational waves may exist, may not exist, nobody will ever know. So, <laughs> Um, but the story started in the 70s. Uh, people got convinced by the radio observations that the waves exist in nature. And um, people, you know, Ray Wise and collaborators, Ron Driver, from Glasgow, and um, a few other names that I don't keep in mind, but if you were to invite Ray Wise, he has the whole history and he acknowledges everybody who contributed in that timeline. Um, uh, came up, you know, eventually came up with this cool idea of the laser electron. So that happened in the 70s, and it took all these years to reach 2015 September to see the first signal. So a few things I'll point out. This is not to read, and it's not, I think the lights is not helping here, but a few things. Uh, it became a real project, LIGO are the detectors, laser interferometry uh, gravitational wave observatory. People made fun of us, I made fun of them, I wasn't around, I was a, a baby at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but people made fun of, how can you call this an observatory, you will never observe anything. Um, uh, so LIGO was a project uh, instigated by Caltech and MIT in Four. Uh, then it became approved for construction in 19. Construction actually started in 94, 95. I joined, I think it's a bit, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, important, it's important to me. Uh, I joined around 99 when all astronomers told me you're insane, uh, if this will never become astronomy. Um, I was doing other things. I was doing real astronomy at the time. This was my hobby. Um, and, um, and then I can't read myself either. Uh, so this is not to read. But basically, we started collecting data with something called the initial LIGO in the 2000s. And we knew the chance of observing anything was very small. And we had prepared everybody. Don't expect detections in the 2000s. So then we got approved for advanced LIGO. And advanced LIGO was built between 2010 and 2015. And in September 2015, we were supposed to start observing officially. When was it, Anne or Carl? It was the Thursday of that week, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like the 20th of September. And the days before the official start, we were observing. <coughs> and that Monday, we got the signal. And had a big leap of sensitivity from initial LIGO to um, uh, advanced LIGO. We got the first signal. Ah, and I forgot to stop the loop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not good. OK, I thought, I guess it plays twice this time. That's the shirt. Okay. Now, what is going on here? Uh, what we saw in the data was the, the little scribbles, and what you see is that uh, you get a signal that's an oscillation. You're measuring the disturbances in space. And the signal becomes, uh, the amplitude of the signal becomes higher and higher, the peaks become higher and higher, and the distance between the peaks becomes smaller and smaller. That means the frequency of the oscillation increases. Okay? And that's what a chirp is. It becomes louder and the pitch is higher. Okay? So, the reason for that is that the two black holes are coming closer and closer together. The disturbance is higher because the gravity between the two black holes being closer is higher. 
and then the motion is faster and faster, so the frequency of the gravitational wave is high. And if you plot it in a frequency as a function of time plot, then you see that it goes up, the frequency goes up fast, and the brightness is higher, so you get the higher one. Now, you just heard the sound. Are the gravitational waves sound waves? I hope I'm not giving you this misunderstanding. Okay, so gravitational waves are not sound waves. But in the LIGO configuration, the frequencies we can detect are roughly between 2030 and six, seven hundred, let's say, well, good detections. A little bit more weaker detections. So our ears are sensitive to sound waves of hundreds of hertz, okay? So you can take a gravitational waveform, pretend it's sound, convert it into a sound signal, and play it. This is what you heard, okay? Um, all right, so that day we got these signals. And then we got uh, uh, Harold's uh, from CETA simulations, and we overlaid them. The simulations were predict as predicted by uh, Einstein's theory. And this signal was on top, well, I should say, as the good theories. <laughs> I was about to say the, the data were on top of, of the simulation, but really the simulation <laughs> comes on top of the data. Um, so we have a confirmation of the theory, and also <coughs> uh, we were able to localize where on the sky this was. <coughs> now, the first time I gave this public lecture back in, uh, uh, I guess, fall 2015, somebody from the audience said, the sky is spying at you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll never forget. Um, now, if you're an astronomer, or if you know anything about observational astronomy, you look at this localization, and you either gasp or cry, uh, but there is nothing, you know, this is a giant part of the sky. You can't tell where this source is from, okay? But for us, it was our first localization, and thank you very much, we were very proud of it. <laughs> um, we can do better now. <clears throat> All right, where are we now? So fast forward to November 17, 2017. Now we have announced uh, six pairs of black holes that have merged. We got the signals. They all look similar. similar. Some are louder, some are weaker. Uh, we can measure the masses of black holes from these scribbles you saw. Uh, the masses vary from below 10, solar, 10 times the mass of the sun or all the way up, again, the individual black holes that are coming together are these two in every pair, these two, these two, et cetera. And then they are merging and they're forming a bigger black hole. So these are the ending of the arrows. So the individual black holes, they are as massive as almost 40 solar masses. And then the final black holes are as massive as almost 60 plus solar times the mass. Okay, so this is the range of LIGO and Virgo, I'm about to tell you, uh, black holes. So very recently, uh, we announced the very first time that we have three gravitational wave detectors seeing a signal. So up until now, we've been talking about LIGO, both in the US. It turns out, with all this momentum and work, the Europeans also decided to build the gravitational wave detector. And there is one in Italy. It started as a French-Italian collaboration. The Dutch joined, the German, no, the Germans didn't join. I think, oh, Spain joined as well. So Virgo is a third detector <coughs> that is operating now and doing very well. Uh, it's this one here. And having now three detectors, allows us to do better in localizing things on the sky. So this is the big smile of our September 2015 event. And this is our first triple detector detection of two binary black holes. And this is how much better we can do on the sky. And the more we learn about where these things are coming from on the sky, uh, the more we can understand what's going on with binary black holes, how do they form, etc. 
So the signals look again like this. Sometimes they're very visible in this time, pre, uh, I'm sorry, frequency time representation. The waveforms and the oscillations can be seen here. And these are the two LIGO detectors and the vertical detectors. Um, all right. And as I said, the interest with black holes now and these binary black hole mergers that honestly, it almost, I'm going to go back, it's almost routine for us now. Because I can tell you, but that's a scary thought to study. I, I wouldn't say it's routine, but we still email each other saying, hey, there's another binary black hole in the data. Uh, but, uh, but it's not as exciting as the first one. Uh, the latest we announced is this one. And it was announced the night before. Actually, I was here in Toronto. It was the night I flew into Toronto. And we didn't have a big announcement, whatever. We just, um, we just circulated our publication within the second community. <coughs> so this one was detected in June, uh, but we made it public just two nights ago. Okay? And we'll keep making public uh, things as we uh, finish our analysis. So what we're trying to understand as we detect more and more of these is actually the astrophysics of binary black holes. Uh, predictions about how binary black holes might form and what we understand about them go all the way back to ancient times when Dick Bond was making predictions about them. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and we're still trying to understand, you know, clearly the existing nature. There is no doubt about it. But we, we still don't understand how two black holes like this can find themselves in pairs, eventually killing themselves and forming one single black hole. Okay. So figuring out, I'm not going to show you all of this, but basically there is some uh, good understanding for how we think binary black holes are forming, but uh, different environments can form them in completely different ways. But we're still working on this, and this is uh, uh, open. There's tons of open questions in terms of how this is. All right. So normally, my public lecture ends here. I suspect I may be out of time. How much? Okay. All right. So normally, I end here, and I tell the audience that we have discovered lots of binary black holes. And we have opened a new window, a new type of sun. And we're seeing now the cosmos with new, well, not with new eyes. We're here in the cosmos with a new instrument. Okay. So um, it's like we, uh, you know, we could only watch. And now we have a way of hearing new things. And what's the next frontier? The next frontier is to discover sources that themselves don't just only emit electromagnetic waves, or they don't just only emit gravitational waves, but they emit both types of waves. Like you have real movies where you get both image, video, and sound together. And I end these talks, I used to end these talks by saying, we hope we're going to reach that point. <coughs> well, we reached that point. <laughs> <laughs> this on, on August, oh my goodness, is it three months now? August 17th, exactly to the day, three months. We walk up and we had an automated uh, uh, signal uh, in our data. Uh, oh, yeah, so this is my ending slide from other talks. Uh, where I say that there could be things other than black holes, it might be neutron stars merging in a similar way, emitting gravitational waves, but neutron stars are made of real matter, they're not just full uh, uh, dominance of gravity. And if you have real matter, you have charged particles, and charged particles will give you electromagnetic waves. And then we expect to see not just gravitational waves, but maybe we'll see gamma rays and X-rays. Maybe we'll see uh, visible and infrared and radio. And maybe eventually we'll see neutrinos. And what I'm about to tell, and that would put together the multi-messenger type of astronomy, where we have two different types of messengers. One messenger electromagnetic waves, 
one messenger filtration. Um, and well, three months ago, we woke up to automated messages that told us that we had signals in our gravitational waves. They were coming, we could tell the shape of the signal, it had the same chirp signature, we could measure the masses, now we can do these things fast. And the masses were not black hole masses, they were neutron star-like masses, one and a half times the mass of the sun. And we also had an alert from our gamma ray colleagues, uh, observational astronomers, who said, we have a gamma ray signal um, that we suspect it might be associated with mergers, but we never had proof. And that started our August 17th day. Um, so we basically knew very quickly when it was a very strong signal, the loudest gravitational wave detection we have ever had up until then. And it became the source known as GW, gravitational wave source, 1708. And this is how it looked like in our three detectors, because now we use three detectors. So uh, a faint chirp, increasing frequency, becoming louder, brighter and brighter, higher amplitude in Hancock, a clear chirp throughout the whole band in Livingston, and nothing in Berlin. We'll come back. Um, now look at the seconds. I think I mentioned only in passing that our first binary black hole merger was 0.2 seconds. Everything else was below one second. Okay? Uh, so this is, look at the scale, seconds, 10, 20, 28. I can tell you in our data, we had 140 seconds of signal in gravitational waves. That was very much connected to the fact that the masses were small, one and a half times, instead of 20, 30, 40 solar masses. Okay. So the lower the mass, the longer the signal. <coughs> So we analyzed our data, and basically, uh, we didn't rush immediately to make this gorgeous plot, uh, which we made eventually at Northwestern. Uh, but we, um, we now know that we had seen for the first time neutron stars, which are much lower in mass, one and a half roughly. And we know neutron stars existed. This is not the first discovery of pairs of neutron stars. House and Taylor discovered them in 74. They proved gravitational waves must exist in nature with radio pulsar observations. But now for the first time, we see that we can get gravitational waves from the merger of the neutron stars, while the radio observations don't show us the merger. But we know lots of neutron stars in nature. Uh, now we see the merger, and what is the final product? We don't know. Is it a heavy neutron star? Is it a black hole, new black hole? We don't know. And we're uh, connecting it, of course, to other black holes we know in X-rays. And the blue black holes, they don't do. But the blue black holes on this plot, uh, that are the light of black holes, and they are in pairs of black holes. The purple black holes are in pairs with other things, not blue. So this is now the zoo of neutron star black holes. And we're now starting to populate the lower mass regime with gravitational waves. <coughs> All right, a couple more things to mention. This is now our sky maps, the giant bananas of the binary black holes. First time we have three detectors. Now we can localize much better. This source, uh, we could tell 130, the closest source ever. Only 130 million, I'm sorry. A hundred, it should be a hundred and thirty million light years away. Okay, um, so that's really close uh, compared to any of the binary black holes. And uh, we could localize it very well on the sky. Go back, even though there was nothing in the Virgo data. And I'll just say in half a minute why. The Virgo detector was working perfectly fine. It was on, it was collecting data. The source was very close. We can tell that because we have the LIGO data and we can analyze them and tell how far away the source is. 
And Virgo should have seen the source, but it didn't. And it was basically the same effect as when you're driving and you're looking at your rear view mirror. And you look at your rear view mirror and you see the cars behind you. And when they come a bit too close, you lose them. You lose them for a narrow range in distance. So there's a particular part of the sky that if the source happens to be there, you lose the source. It, it, there are parts of the sky that gravitational wave detectors cannot hear sources from. So for Virgo, the source was in that part of the sky. It was in the blind spot or the deaf spot, whatever. Um, so, uh, so the fact that Virgo did not see it allowed us to localize it on the sky very well. And then we told our electromagnetic partners, the gamma ray people knew already there was something going on, but we could tell the rest of the electromagnetic partners where to look. I told you already that the signal is very long, so I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time. And I'll show you the gamma ray signal just so that you have how different these signals are in the different messengers. So the chirp is here, it ends when the two neutron stars collide, there's no more gravitational waves. Then silence in the messenger community. And then gamma rays pick up, and we got a signal in the gamma rays, Fermi, the satellite that couldn't remember what it looks like. Um, and then back down to noise, that lasted a couple of seconds the gamma ray signal. And then that little spot on the sky would communicate it with other observers uh, and would tell them where to look. But let me tell you that just that two gamma rays and gravitational waves in those two seconds of difference of coming together solved the long-standing mystery. Uh, we've known of, of gamma ray bursts for 40, 50 years, late 60s we discovered them. We, the collective team. I was not even born. Um, and then in the early 90s, we figured out the short gamma ray bursts and long gamma ray bursts. Late 90s, we figured out the long gamma ray bursts are supernovae, basically. The short gamma ray bursts, we, that were suspicion that they were mergers of neutron stars, but we never had proof that they were mergers. And for the first time, with the gravitational wave signal, we could tell two neutron stars had been spiraled and merged. And then we had the, uh, the gamma ray signal. So we got 50 year old mystery solved within two seconds on that. With a little bit more analysis. Um, and then we told the rest of the community where to look at. Uh, and they used our localization. And they went. And as soon as it was night in the south, where, where the localization was, the several teams uh, looked at the sky, and they realized that a galaxy that looked kind of boring on the sky um, had a very bright source for optical, in the optical light. Uh, not bright enough to see by eye, but certainly with a little small telescope, you can see it. Nothing, 20 days ago, somebody had an observation of this same region. There was nothing there, and that day there was something there. Then later, there was a massive campaign involving close to 4,000 astronomers. And they went and looked from X-rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio kept looking, after we found the galaxy, kept looking at that point, no longer at that banana, but at that point. What else are we going to discover in electromagnetic waves? What else are we going to learn? So one thing we learned is that this little point I showed you next to the galaxy, here's the big galaxy, here's the point, that first day, that source had a color. We could measure the color. It was bluish. By August 21st, the source had faded. You can see it's a little fade uh, and, and it's a little bright on the screen, but I hope you can see there's a smudge there and it's reddish. So it went from blue to red. With more data that I'm not showing here, 
I'll, I'll show quickly in the next slide, actually. Mm -hmm. What we could tell is that this source was behaving and had exactly the characteristics of things, um, of models that were predicting how gold, heavy elements like gold and platinum normally, no, no, normally, potentially uh, might form in nature, okay? So it's hypothesis for how these heavy elements might form in nature. The elements we get in our mountains and, and we find them on Earth, they don't form on Earth. They form through events like this, measures of nature. And there are signatures at the time of their formation and there were predictions for how <coughs> these things should look like in the visible light. And it was the first time there was one suspicion before, two, three, even weaker suspicions but it was the first time now that we had the gravitational wave signal that was telling us very clearly two neutron stars merged. <coughs> and then we got the optical signature that was telling us heavy elements like gold and platinum are forming. And it had exactly, now this is a scientific plot I will not describe, a lot more data than I'm showing you in the simple pictures, but we can follow you know, in wavelength and brightness, etc follows exactly what we expected from how the production of heavy elements like gold should look like in the nuclear submersion. And our data are in agreement with the production of All right, so the picture of what we saw basically is that we had the final merger of the two neutron stars. I'm almost, almost done. Uh, in the center of the merger, we got emission in the ultraviolet, optical, and infrared. But then we also got the gamma rays that were detected first. And eventually we got the detections in X-rays and radio. So this is the timeline. We started with the gravitational wave. Two seconds later, second gamma rays. 12 hours later, optical discovery. Then we looked in the radio. There was nothing. A day and a half later, for the optical, you have to wait for the night. You have to observe throughout. So second night, we got infrared and spectra, these wavelength signatures that showed us the heavy elements. Then we looked in the X-rays two and a half days later with a NASA satellite. Nothing in the X-rays. No surprise. And then nine days later, the X-rays appeared and lasted a minute. Then the radio appeared 16 days later. So the full range of electromagnetic emission came after that merge. And every, I don't have time to go into every detail, but every photon we're getting in these different wavelengths is, has a story. It's telling us it has a scientific information. It has meaning for us okay, about what happened. All right. So this is what
thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, um, do gravitational waves also um, restore time? And if so, would it be possible to use atomic clocks mm -hmm. to, to detect them? Yes, yeah, so, so yes, they do disturb time as well. And, and there is scientific work examining whether atomic clocks can be used as gravitational wave detectors. And you know, I could point you to a paper that examines exactly this question. Right now, the understanding is that it's not possible to reach the accuracy we need for an actual detection, but, but people are exploring that possibility and may be down the road, but not in the okay. The accuracy, the precision we need is not there. Yes. Um, if I understand correctly, I mean, is the detection of gravity waves in your detectors like essentially instantaneous? Like, you turn on the laser and then ding, 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 and you know that a, la that a gravity wave has gone through. Yeah, so we have, uh, thanks to a lot of work from, uh, you know, our, our students and our postdocs, and again, I'm pointing uh, to the group over there, um, and, and many in my group and across the groups, we focused a lot and we spend a lot of years, I would say, developing data analysis tools that can work fast enough. So as we collect the data, within seconds or even faster, we analyze the data and there's automated pipelines that if there is a signal, we get automated emails telling us there's something about the noise. Now, there are signals that sometimes are so weak that the fast pipelines, data analysis pipelines, can find them. So then we also have offline uh, more slow running, more detailed analysis, and uh, we, it has happened when we find signals uh, after the fact. So we record all the data and we go deeper into the model to our data to find signals. Uh, so we don't always find everything online, but yes, we can find things, most of these things were found in the And does that pipeline extend into the other? people that are, so you're saying, okay, we're pretty oh. sure we got something here, so yeah. point your telescopes that way. Or yeah, so we have a whole system, yes. Yeah, so first of all, we collect the data from the LIGO 2 detectors. Uh, we now also communicate with the Virgo detectors. If there is a trigger in each detector, there is automated uh, communication. We let each other know. Um, uh, and then it takes, before we tell our electromagnetic partners, it still takes human uh, intervention. So the collaboration gets somebody's on duty, somebody's phone rings, whatever time it, uh, of the day or night, they get up, and a cubicle will go on a telephone system, we look at the signal, we look at the data and the evidence, and we make a human decision of whether to alert our electronic partners. And that, the fastest I think we have done, how? 20? 20 minutes? Yeah. yeah. So within 20 minutes, we have sent alerts out. Uh, and, you know, eventually, with more confidence, we can reach maybe automated alerts. But we feel like we still want a human to look at the data and make sure things are okay. Uh, so there's a little bit of emission as the final product, the merged product, settles. Yeah. But once it settles into something that is fairly symmetric, uh, gravitational wave emission stops. So basically to get gravitational waves to be emitted, you need this asymmetry uh, to, to exist. Otherwise, you don't get disturbance. Okay, so there will be a moment that both gravitational waves from that effect are not coming anymore. From that particular source, that's <coughs> correct. But there will be other sources elsewhere in the universe, yes. Suppose I'm so unlucky as to be on a planet, you know, a few hundred kilometers from this merger. Yeah. Uh, you know, am I, I, I'm hit by an order one gravity wave. Yeah. Is my planet disrupted or what does no, it No, like? so, so basically I think, uh, so I don't have the numbers in my head, but even if something happened at the distance of the sun, 
uh, if there were a pair of black holes at the distance of the sun, if you just calculated the gravitational wave effect, uh, it's not significant to disturb us. We would be having other problems. <laughs> 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 not the waves that will cause the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Gravity is really weak. <laughs> 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 uh, what happens in the, to the space between, like kind of at the center when the two black holes merge? That you mean inside the final black hole? Or, I'm sorry. Well, so the, the two black holes are merging, and this is still regular space, and then once they... Oh, up, once they connect? To that point. Yeah, so that space is highly <coughs> disturbed. It's very, the disturbances are non-linear, very high amplitude. That's why you get the highest uh, uh, amplitude emission in the gravitational waves right when you get that connection of the two black holes. Uh, but then as you emit, they shed this disturbance, the high disturbance, away from them through gravitational waves and it settles and gravity wins and wants gravity is a central force and wants to make everything spherical. And they settle basically into a single black hole that's spherical and it stops in the gravitation. So the point that's midway between gets covered up by the event horizon, the event horizon around each other. Yeah, whole and they get, they get engulfed into a single event horizon, which is kind of the surface, although it's not a hard surface, of the common black hole that is disturbed initially, and then it settles. I was wondering if more gravitational wave observed from this would be coming online soon, and if so, how would that improve your ability to localize the source? Yes, so we do a lot of studies of exactly this. There are more detectors coming online, so the one that will come online next is in Japan, uh, and I think their schedule is for um, I think ideally maybe 2018 was originally, I think it's going to be 2019 if everything goes well from where we are now. Um, and then the next one that has been approved is in India, uh, but I think that's going to be more like 2024. And, uh, and we need more detectors because the, the more uh, detectors we have, uh, we can localize more and more so we can bring it down to most of the sources to be localized to within one square degree. Right now, the best localization we have, like the binary neutron star, is 28 square degrees. Uh, so if, even that, it's big for uh, electromagnetic astronomy. Uh, and then the other reason we need more detectors is that um, not the detectors are not on online all the time. So they have another small cubic cycle. Uh, half the time, maybe two-thirds of the time, they're on and operating well. Uh, so if, to have three detectors at any given time to be covered by three detectors, you need to have more than three operating at some uh, time. Are you expecting to observe the black hole merging with the neutron star? The black, yes, yeah, so whether, so, so, okay. So it is an open question whether the two neutron stars are going to give you a final black hole or a bigger neutron star, more massive neutron star. Right now, we're having, um, so in fact, one of the postdocs here is working on, on exactly some of these questions. Um, right now, we have a hard time telling what happened with this system. And it's going to be a challenge with neutron stars and the LIGO detectors. The reason is that the Final, the end of the merger with black holes, we see them right in the middle of the frequency band that the LIGO detectors are sensitive to. But the neutron stars, because they are lower mass, the final merging frequency happens above a thousand hertz, which is, so from your perspective, above a thousand hertz. Um, so that is where the detectors are losing a lot of sensitivity. So we don't directly uh, get good data at the final frequency. And therefore, it's hard for us to probe is the remnant settling the way a black hole would settle or the way a neutron star would settle. Uh, the electromagnetic emission can probe that question as well, because if you are left with a neutron star, 
the electromagnetic emission would behave differently than if you were left with a black hole. So we're hoping with more events that we'll get more clues and hopefully we'll answer that question. Can you ask, you know, do you expect a black hole to start finding Oh, I'm sorry. We, were you asking about a hybrid system? Yeah. A black hole and a neutron star uh, merging? Yeah. Okay, yes, we do expect that. Uh, that's going to be the, net, the third press conference. Uh, <laughs> um, there are theoretical predictions. Uh, myself, I have worked on that and, and other groups independently. And nature tells us that if you have a way of forming two black holes in pairs and two neutron stars in pairs, there is a way to also form a neutron star and a black hole together. And they can merge. It would be nice if we can detect waves from such a nature as well. Thank you. I think I have in your chart like five or six of these different um, <coughs> dual uh, both binary stars and, and black holes. So, and, and you said that was roughly 130 million years ago. Yeah. So, so basically what we're detecting is there must be a lot of them out there if you're detecting that many in the space of whatever a year and a half yes. that you've been detecting. Yes, right? yes. So, so, so there is, there is many happening in the universe. We can tell by the numbers we have seen within about two years now. Uh, we can figure out how many are happening per unit volume. Because <coughs> our detectors cannot see these merger events to the edge of the universe. Okay, our detectors can see them out to a certain distance. If they are further away, the waves are way too weak for the detectors to detect them. Uh, so, so we can tell, OK, this is the volume we we're probing. This is how often we get. This is how sensitive we are, etc. We can do statistics and figure out how often they happen. And yes, there's tons of them happening out there. Most of them we don't detect. Um, and for most of them, the waves go through us, as I said, all the time. Right. But they're too weak for us to detect. So what kind of time frame? That was 130 million to, to what kind of time frame did you be detecting? Uh, so the, the first black hole we saw, so it happened uh, over a billion years away. Mm -hmm. So binary black holes that come with these big masses, we can see them <coughs> far away. But in astronomy, seeing far away, it means also you, you eventually detect things that happened a long time ago. Our universe is about 14 billion years uh, old, and I can translate that. Uh, so, 10, uh, so I think our LIGO detectors are still improving in how sensitive they are. So some of the massive black holes that we saw, like the September 2015, we would be able to see 10 times. Uh, let me see. Yeah. 10 times further away from where we saw the first one, once we get the full sensitivity. So we're going to see a lot more. But still, the universe is vast bigger, <laughs> more or even bigger than that. So there's more happening. We have two people asking the second question. Does anybody else want to ask them? OK. Oh, here. Uh, so yes. Uh, you mentioned that there was Ah, yes. So, uh, so every detector uh, has the ability of, of either seeing the whole sky or seeing only a patch of the sky. So I'll start with our eyes. So our eyes have the ability to look forward, like I'm looking at you, and a bit of side vision. But my eyes cannot see back, or I cannot see under the floor, right? Uh, our ears have bigger visibility because I can hear sounds behind my head, even though I cannot see <coughs> things behind my head. So gravitational wave detectors um, are more like our ears. They can hear gravitational waves from all over, almost, almost all over, unless the source is in this, roughly in the same plane as the L shape. So if you're too close to the plane of the detector, the source is too, not too close, but too much in the plane of the detector, and it's hard for the detector to detect the gravitational waves. So that's where the blind spot lies. Okay? It 
you're above the detector, it's easy. The further in the plane you come, the harder it is. Okay? It's a wide circle. Yes. Yeah. So if you add a third chrome, you get T for the price of half. And any plans on upgrade or any other I'm sorry, so any plans for upgrade of LIGO, you said? Yes, if you, you get me on 10 for my 15, you get you minus 17. Oh, uh, so we are, uh, so 10 to the minus 18 is not where we are now, is where we're going to be when we reach our design sensitivity, which we hope is going to be uh, maybe in three years. And then uh, there is a plan, but it's not funded. Uh, uh, to go yet another factor of two in sensitivity. But if we want to go to 10 to the minus 19, so a factor of 10 better, we need new facilities. So we're working on designs for new facilities, um, but you know that will take 10, 15 years if we ever achieve convincing people to find it. Dollar scales, I feel like. Although we agree to that, rather than have an L, you have an intro one like that, you get two more, they only add one half. Yes, yeah, so we, we, in, in a way, we're kind of trying to do this in space. <laughs> uh, but on the Earth, it's a little harder to add the third dimension. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, maybe I'll, the last question. I'll, I'll yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, there's a, a lot of talking about the nature of the vacuum, the pure vacuum, uh, that yeah. it's, it's not really an absolute nothingness. Mm -hmm. So I read something that they were observing these virtual particles and things like that. So since the uh, gravitational waves are disturbances in the very fabric of space, mm -hmm. would, be, would it be possible to place one of these experiments observing at the quantum scale, the vacuum, yeah. right beside the detector, so that when a wave passes through, it can be used to see what happens like to understand the, the quantum world better, if anything changes, happens, to understand the nature of the fabric of space, w would it be possible? OK, so. Sorry. Uh, no, it's OK. No, no, it's OK. I'm just going to try and break your question. So, uh, so first of all, let me say the following, that the, there are quantum effects that can produce gravitational waves. Uh, but the strength of those gravitational, first of all, they will not look like shirts, like what I described, but the strength of those kinds of gravitational waves are way too weak for the LIGO detectors to find. Okay, so that's one thing. They might come in the right frequencies where the LIGO detectors exist, but we would need what we call third generation detectors to be a factor of 10 more sensitive, or even even more than that, to see the quantum effects that might exist generating gravitational waves and then probing that physics. Okay, so our gravitational waves, I'm sorry, our gravitational wave detectors can reach them. Now, um, how about the particles? Then what you ask. So what I didn't understand is you said something about putting something close to our current detectors. Yeah. That I didn't get. Yeah, sorry. I, I wasn't meaning to observe quantum gravitational waves. OK. But to observe if yeah. the gravitational waves yeah. somehow uh, were produced by quantum effects. No, no if they disturb the quantum world. So oh, obs observe, oh, the, oh. observe the particles. Yeah. When the wave arrives, so the wave arrives, the detector tells you it's passing, and then you observe the particles or or the, the vacuum. Yeah. You see no. what happens. No, the disturbance at that scale is is just it's minuscule. You could there's nothing we could detect at that scale, ah, at okay. the quantum scale. Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't the, the strength of it's so weak that you won't measure anything. No, no um, difference. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right, I think uh, that's a good point to end it at. Let's uh, thank the people.